everybody back here at Siegel Talk at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. It's a sunny day here in uh, New York. Um, um, and uh, after surprisingly cold days last week, it seems like spring um, is with us. But of course, um, all that, what the time of Corona brought us also has not yet left us. And we are in the middle of it, um, even so, so many signs um, are, are promising and the current leadership and the speech from Biden um, yesterday shows that there are things are possible. America is moving fast. But it is still a devastating uh, time for the performing arts. I had a call with uh, European uh, curators uh, yesterday that a state right not behind this farm just gave 200 million to artists for projects. They are trying to put three, four festivals together and um, there's a lot of uh, complications. Um, but here uh, in the US, um, we really don't know where it's going. It's a time of uncertainty. Things are changing, have already changed most probably we are so close, we do not really see it only later on, it will be much clearer. And I mean, in order to help us to process the moment um, um, we are in, we have with us one of the great uh, uh, um, contributors uh, to the cultural and artistic life in New York City over decades, a titan uh, in his field, we look up to him and we all, um, followed also what was on his mind when he invited artists from around the world, New York, is often a bit, uh, uh, I would say, provincial in some way. A lot of what we see on stages are Americans' plays or British plays, and very, very little from around the world. And like a, a beacon of light, uh, a house on the hill, a shining one, uh, is Bam Bam's uh, festival. And um, for over over thirty years, that Joe has been involved uh, with it in the history, in the legacy of uh, Harvey Lichtenstein. Harvey, who actually came to the Siegel Center, I think it was his last public interview he gave, I visited him a couple of times before that. And so we feel very, very connected to BAM, the BAM archives, this fantastic book about the Next Wave Festival. So Joe, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a great pleasure, Frank. I Joe, where that. are you? Are you in the Hamptons? Are you in Bali? Are you uh, in uh, <laughs> is any uh, fancy place? Uh, I'm on East 9th Street between Broadway and University Place in Manhattan. That is where I'm, I'm in my living room right now. Amazing, amazing. And uh, if we, we talked before, this is a fantastic William Kentridge painting behind you. Yes, I had the great privilege of working with Bill Kentridge several times at BAM. And this was, uh, the background of this is the iconic images that he created for uh, his de design and direction of Mozart's The Magic Flute which I made in the band, so. I mean, that in itself, what a great piece of work of art that humanity, mankind produced and, uh, and Kendridge and you all together, that's amazing. Maybe one day he it could be with us. That would be also fantastic. But let me all of you talk a little bit of Joe Melillo. We also have international um, 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 listeners and viewers uh, who do not know as much about BAM. BAM is a great uh, institution here in, in New York City. And Joe was the executive producer from, I could say, just when the last millennium ended, 1999 to 2018. And he was responsible for BAM's artistic direction, overseeing programming in all its performance spaces, which is the Howard Gilman Opera House, the Howway Theater, which they co-created it away with Peter Brook, the Bam Fisher, the experimental space and Rose Cinemas, the very significant uh, uh, place also for, for, for movies, um, uh, how it is curated. And uh, Joe spent uh, uh, and served still previously at Bam's producing director and founding director of the Next Wave Festival. It's an iconic festival. The only thing we have in New York City that is in a way a festival, even so it's not a festival in the European sense, where for two or three weeks a city celebrates theater. It spans over a season, but it is a festival. It's the Next Wave Festival. It debuted in 1983. And for 35 years, uh, Joe has worked um, at BAM, and he really, really has fostered the work, work of emerging and establishing artists, and uh, New York artists, American artists, and global and international artists. So we, a lot of dance program, great dance program, opera programming. So it's a very unique uh, work. 
um, he has done, and he has really been uh, recognized for also creating such uh, uh, international partnerships and long lasting uh, uh, friendships with artists who knew this is the place to be, not only for artists, great artists like Bob, Bob Wilson, but for the Pina Bausch of this world, the Sasha Wells, the Schaubühne, many, many others, something you could count on as a partner who was not just looking at daily politics and what's in or out, but really long long-term partners and um, he is also highly decorated and I hope uh, uh, Joe will forgive me for saying this, he is a, a commandante like a, a Che Guevara who was commandante Che Guevara, he's a commandeur officer and chevalier de l'ordre des arts et des lettres from France, uh, he's an OBE in Great Britain, he is a knight of the royal order um, of the Polar Star in Sweden and the Knight of the National Order of Quebec in Canada. He has served both as the uh, Gish Award panelist and the Heinz Award Junior uh, uh, panel. He is currently the International Artistic Advisor for Columbia uh, Artists and the 2019 Director's Fellow and the, at the Center for Ballet and the Arts at NYU, where he has taught uh, over decades. I think he is a lecturer at colleges and universities. So he's close to our field and um, and where we are in. So uh, Joe, welcome. And I apologize we always say, this is all about listening. And then I go on and on, but I think it is important. <laughs> that people know. Well, well, at least so, you're self-aware, Frank. Yeah, so how, how are you? How are you in these days of Corona? Uh, well, actually, um, I'm fully vaccinated. And when you are fully vaccinated, the gift is relief that you feel that you can be a a par an active participant in society again. So uh, I'm healthy and uh, very much engaged in a lot of, of creative projects and working with colleagues for their goals and objectives. So I'm well, thank you. W were you concerned uh, over the last year? Well, I, I think the unprecedented reality of uh, creates a, a, an insecurity. I mean, you, we've never done this before. Um, and so, um, and given what you eloquently articulated about my professional career at BAM, a lot of, of my time was spent on an airplane, in theaters around the world, in hotels, taxis, um, so what am I saying? I haven't been in my home, my apartment for the amount of time I have just experienced from March of last year when we all shut down until, um, you know, here we are today on, on April 30th in the, uh, the year 2021. And uh, so I have had the rediscovery of my home in that time. So again, that's answering your question about um, the unprecedented nature of this reality um, was quite challenging, to be honest. Mm. So what did you do at home? How did you structure your days? How did well, you I, uh, uh, to reveal the authentic answer to your question is that, um, when I went to undergraduate school, I thought I was going to become an English literature professor because I liked to read. And it's from reading uh, that led to my concentration of English literature and that I had a course in reading Shakespeare. And then I found myself in the college's cafeteria with a, my uh, cohorts. And there was a group of people across the cafeteria that were having a hilarious time together. And I said to my pal, who, who are those people? And he said, oh, those are the theater people. And so, what what happened is that I learned they were being taught how to amplify, animate, act, and direct Shakespeare, and I was reading, and the rest is history. 
you know, the theater just opened up to me. And so, so long story short, Frank, this has been a new re-engagement in my reading and probably have read, you know, a book a week fiction and really? most recently memoirs, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, that's the answer, reading. What books did you read? What did you learn? Well, I just finished Andre Gregory's memoir, uh, which was completely fascinating uh, because I did see Alice that he directed and created with a group of actors called the Manhattan uh, Project. And um, I, I didn't realize what a novelty professional career he really had uh, in the regional theater. That was, a, I didn't know that. I've always thought he was a New York centric product, but that's not true. He had multiple experience throughout this country in regional theater. So, so that was fascinating. Um, so yeah, that's just an example of, of a memoir that I just finished. Mm. Yeah. But right now I'm reading David Sedaris. So he has a compendium of, of essays that he's published. And so I'm deep into his humor. Mm. Yeah, it, really, it, it is a time where we, we look inside and, um, and perhaps also take a step back from the massive, often aggressive um, uh, you know, influence of the outside world, of the television, the media, the film, the things we do. and. Um, um, Joe, when you, you have an experience few of us have actually, even very few people on planet earth, I would say, um, you know, for running such a significant organization for a while. Um, looking at the world, how it is now in theater and performance, what do you think about? Well, I think um, uh, the creative imagination is not static. So therefore, the great creative minds of this country and other global communities uh, remains active. And so the need has been uh, met by the resurfacing of digital protocols as a methodology for creative energies uh, and so, yes, I mean, there's been an, a surf fight of riches for individuals who are making work using the digital protocols. Now, I, I really, to be clear, believe that they are all in elementary school uh, about the actual uses of the technology. Uh, and. But I want to be clear that my point of view is it's not disappearing. I, as we reopen our culture, our societies, live performance is going to be balanced by this digital reality. So that there's a new kind of picture of both the digital and live performance in the theater, dance, music, opera, et cetera. That's, it's just not going to go away. That's the point. Hmm. And I think so you new discoveries. You think BAM will have next to Fisher, Harway, um, the, 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 the movie theaters, there will be a digital arm, a digital um, um, lag arm, a programming unit? Well, I think that, that um, David Binder, who is the artistic director of BAM, uh, is being very clear in the moving the institution to look at what, what is the answer for BAM regarding digital work. So um, I think they're just beginning. So what do I think? The answer is emphatically yes. I think that there will be a, a digital identity for BAM yet to be determined. But I don't, as I said, I will repeat myself. It's not going to disappear. It's not gonna stop. Hmm. I think that, that there, you know, I'm not a, um, a behavioral psychologist, but I think people's behavior 
has been altered by this pandemic and about having to modify uh, their actions and their behavior. So that's why um, what's very positive has been the discovery of work outdoors, uh, indoors with reduced occupancies uh, that the governor and the mayor have obligated. And that will continue as it, it's been, our mayor has announced July 1st that New York City will begin reopening. Uh, the Broadway League still believes that Broadway will reopen after September of this year, but yet to be determined is the ticket buying public's interest in purchasing a ticket in volume to go to a theater venue to sit with a thousand strangers. Um, I don't know yet. We don't know, that's the point. We don't know whether or not they're going to buy. Now, the other fact, is, you know, tourism is not going to jumpstart the city until autumn of 2022 at the earliest. Um, and that's just simply the reality. That's, that's pragmatism of understanding the hospitality industry, the tourist industry is going to be slower than most people want for the city. Yeah. It just, that's, that's the reality. I mean, you, any report from the airline industries, from, from hotel industries, you know, they're completely reliant on tourism. Yeah. And you, you've it, already addressed the fact that, you know, but our European and global communities, they're not the same as this country. I mean, um, you know, I have colleagues in, in South America and, uh, in Asia, that they, they really have s very serious issues about vaccinations, about just getting the amount of dosage that they need for their populations. So we can't have a false sense of where we are in the global community. Um, we make it, we, we here in New York City have done very, very well in, in getting vaccinated. But that's not the way the world is working at the moment. Yeah. And again, this is all in the context of tourism coming to New York City and being a ticket buyer for our art and cultural or entertainment outlets. It's still a, a big question mark, Frank. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I think 80% of tickets on Broadway, as far as I know, is tourists or people from Connecticut, New Jersey, who come, uh, who travel in, will they do the same? Uh, I think 50% of New Yorkers um, have the first shot at least. Many are now not doing the second one, and, but you know, how, what if someone from Brazil comes in and from Southern America and from European countries, India, where will the borders be open? Will they be closed? Will they be, because the world will not be as fast? Uh, as America is the moment, it is the, um, quite remarkably actually, you know, it's a, a leader in the um, in vaccination and um, what, what would it all mean? But I, I think you are right. I think sports industry also at the moment is experiencing a younger generation, a dropout uh, for one or two years. Young kids are not watching, not seeing uh, this and uh, people are not watching it at home. Um, as much as they used to, and the Oscars dropped 50% uh, in, the, in, the, in the, so what about theater? It's a good question. And also what is theater doing for everyone? So um, the, the emotional connection is, is, is a rupture. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, I, I wanna extrapolate a little bit more because um, this premise about changes in behavior and the Academy Awards on television that netted only 10 million viewers where it was double to triple that amount is an important fact for us to learn from that people are changing their relationships to various 
opportunities that were part of the American identity. You know, the, you know, we all have lived with the great beauty of the, you know, the golden age of Hollywood and what that mythology is about. And the Academy Awards, you know, was one of those, those great award shows, you know, that put a lens on, you know, the film industry. Well, the film industry has profoundly changed. I mean, streaming, you, every week you can read in the New York Times about the advancements that the streaming outlets, the corporations that have streaming, how they're just galloping away. They're making product. I mean, and that's where the employment is. And, and that's where they're, the producing entities are making deals for exhibiting their work, not in theatrical venues, but in a streaming service. So it's, you know, you can't escape the capitalist system in terms of where the buck is going to go in terms of product. So. So are you concerned about uh, the, the fiber, the structure of New York theater performance institutions? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, because uh, again, it's that insecurity. When you, before the pandemic, there was a certain uh, certainty about the mechanism, the ecology of New York City uh, art and culture. So that uh, you understood that BAM had a legacy of ticket buyers for theater and a ticket buyer for dance, a ticket buyer for opera. Well, what happened to those people? You know, what, what does all this mean in terms of as, you, as a performing arts center you curate these works. We, Frank, we really don't know if that system is going to hold. There's certainly going to be. Uh, they haven't disappeared from you know the five borough system, uh, but whether or not they're ready to make a ticket purchase, Bams Opera House is a, opened in 1918. And you know it seats two thousand people, and sure. you know that's a, a large number of ticket buyers. You know you're not doing like a one night show. I, I was able to curate at least four performances of a production, uh, and that's that's volume, that's quantity, and and you really don't know what's going to happen. And I think this is one of the legacies, but also a little bit overlooked that what you did with international program, and yes, all experimental in a way, you fill 2000 seats, but it was also, I think, a, a tremendous effort behind, which we perhaps also not fully aware of, but this was in the good times when, you know, everybody was out and people were there. So that is a big question. What will happen? And is it also the right thing at the moment? Who knows, you know, is that the, the important thing, how do we get the seats full or do we say what has to change? I, what do you think? Well, I get, you know, I think that, that it's organizations like BAM have to convince a ticket buyer that there's safety in coming into their theaters, okay? Um, and, you know, that is going to be part of the job is, is that, you know, whether it's air filtration, whether it's, you know, social distancing, whatever the choice is going to be for the producing or presenting organization, they have to demonstrate to the prospective ticket buyer that it's safe. Now, they may en end up having to uh, quantify the that the ticket buyer is vaccinated. I mean, you know, I have my I have my little white card, you know, and, and do I need to show that when I uh, purchase a ticket or when I'm going to enter the arena of a, of a venue? Uh, no, you, you, you're, the people who are going to, be, who are currently watching this discussion between us 
and the people after this, we, we will know so much more by the autumn of this year. At this moment, the litmus test right now is we don't know the answer. I have all the questions that need to be asked, but I'm devoid of providing answers. I mean, concrete answers. I'm a pragmatist, you know. I, I, I do the research and make the artistic judgment that this particular work of art belongs within one of our theaters. And I can authentically communicate to our audiences of that time, why I'm curating, why I'm bringing this production to New York City. And because I, what we should be addressing is the fact that BAM is a global and a local arts and cultural center for the city of New York. It's a great legacy that was established by Harvey Lichtenstein. And yes, in 1983, when I was hired to work with him to create the Next Wave Festival, and that the festival, again, is a three month multidisciplinary art, uh, initiative that was always global from the moment it was created. Now, we use a different word, we would say international. So there were international artists in 1983, in the 80s, and then we changed our vocabulary to be more responsive to a global identity. Uh, but that was BAM's place at the cultural landscape of New York City. And that finding the most innovative progressive artists in the performing arts to give them a platform. And at that time, and the, during my tenure, I, could, I would say, you know what? I live in a community of fundamentally curious people, New Yorkers. I, believe are genuinely curious. So whether or not, my point being, that curiosity has been neutered by the pandemic, I don't know. I, all I know is I know we're different from having survived, those of us lucky enough not to be infected by the virus, that we've survived. But what are we going to do about our participation in our society regarding art and culture that requires us to go into a, a venue to be seated in order to be open to receive the art making of the producing and, and presenting organizations of our great city. Don't know, Frank. Don't really know the answer to that. And that's actually, uh, that is concerning um, that someone like you doesn't know um, and uh, with all the questions and the right questions you have. Um, it's uh, and additionally, uh, the layer, what also our guests talked about, whether it was Rachel Cooper or Liz Hayes or Olga Garay, you know, what's going to happen to that global view? Um, what is going to happen? And well, it is no, no, it, that, that the issue is that I, someone like myself, a professional, I can't go to Madrid. I can't go to uh, Rome or uh, Barcelona. I can't get to Hong Kong or I can't go to Brazil. You, so that the professional process of being present in a live performance in a global community, that has been corrupted. You know, that as a, you don't artistically program by the means we are communicating right now. You have to be in the theater. Uh, you know, video, Vimeo, you know, uh, YouTube, those are research tools that, tells you whether or not you should get onto that plane and go to that theater and sit there. Because there is a 
reality of difference between the screen and being in the performance. And Frank, in, in particular, when you're servicing the architecture, which is was my job, I'm three theaters dedicated to the performing arts, space impacts art. And so you can see the work by these great artists, but it's only until you're in the engagement of live performance that you your mind works to be able to imagine that particular work in one of your venues. So something that's programmed in the Harvey Theater, 900 seats versus something that I would program in the Opera House that's 2000 seats and obviously with the Fishman space, which is 250 seats. I mean, it, the, the, so there's been this breakdown in a professional process of mm -hmm. doing your work as a curator in the performing arts. And then again, the backdrop of this is as a performing arts presenter, not as a producing artist, you know, that not as a producing organization, which is working with a, a playwright, with a director, a group of actors, and producing a work specifically for a venue. Mm -hmm. Two different vocabularies as a talking about curating a fully produced work of art that you want to, in a different community that you want to bring to New York City. So that's the big challenge because that, and this is what needs to be examined is that how the women and men who are artistic directors of presenting organizations and their inability to have mobility of a professional process to go see work. And yeah. that this is a big issue. Yeah. You know, yeah probably spend half the year on the road. I don't know the numbers, but um, that's my guess that we, you were not sleeping in your uh, New York apartment when you yeah. went out. The other question also, and yeah, what is Jay Wagman doing or others? You know, how do you how do you look at the world? What will you create? Also, they, we work a lot with Penn, the writers organization. They have the great Penn World Voices Festival going on. I think it's kind of a, a sibling also, BAM's great, the next wave. The idea is to bring writers in, Salman Rushdie and Paul Oster um, and created it in the very first Bush administration. They felt it was such a tunnel vision. 95% of all books sold in the US came from US writers or UK writers. Of the 5%, half of it is French or German because they really engage, support their culture. So you had one or two books from another place. And a lot of the problems we have in this country is because we do not um, see the world um, from a different place. You know, the world that works that the Asia society does or others, you know, the European uh, institution that you try to contribute to say the world is a big place. There are lots of things how we have to look at it. Also what happens when this is missing? When you can travel, companies will not be able to come in. What does it, what does it mean? And, um, and uh, what will, will be the consequences? Do you think um, that future work, also of American artists, um, will be radically uh, changed by this? Or do you think after three, four, five years, it will go back? Well, I think that there's um, a big change in the producing theaters here in the United States. It, um, Across the board, uh, it's a generational change of artistic directors uh, retiring, resigning their positions. So you have uh, new energies, new ideas. Uh, I believe the emphasis is on American playwriting, American artists, American choreographers, composers, et cetera. Uh, I, and I think, uh, I'm concerned uh, that it's less global in their, their viewpoints. Um, and, and that is a real issue, I think, for American society. Yeah, I, I have to extrapolate when I say American society versus New York City, because New York City is, is a different equation. 
and I don't say this um, proudly, is that many of the artistic works that I programmed at BAM only came to New York. They didn't travel across this nation uh, to performing arts centers or producing the venues, et cetera. So, you know, the, the work of Ivo Van Hove, Thomas Ostermeyer, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even the great Pina Bausch has only been to several other locations, Los Angeles being one and Arizona being another. Um, and that only happened once, Frank, you know, uh, and um, so you have multiple generations of Americans who really have never seen a live performance of, of Pina Bausch. We're just an example of, of you know, a great German artist who, who in her lifetime created a new art form called dance theater or in German Tanz theater. Uh, and that adjustment is a predicament for this country because a whole group of people have never seen the work of, you know, Asian, European, South American artists. New Yorkers have, but not the rest of this country. And so that, that is a con particular concern given the background of what I've already said about the, the work came to New York, doesn't travel to other regions of this country. Uh, the men and women who have grown up in this society, artists who have been now given the opportunity to run institutions, producing theater, producing dance, producing opera, uh, and don't really have the experience of working with these international artists who are creating their new work, which falls under the innovative, progressive categories. And that's, that's maturing form, artistic form. And so there's an imbalance is basically what I'm saying between, you know, the country goes like this, New York City is, you know, at the apex and, you know, Pocatello, Idaho is at the end, you know, that's, so I, I mean, that's not a pretty picture, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And um, I mean, and we do think that in a way of, you know, from, since the French Revolution, that great democratic gesture, um, um, the access to art, the access to education, the access to health, the access to democracy is a human right. We think of it in a way, you know, globally, and yet it is so complicated in a country that has a quite, it's a rich country. So it's not just about money. So the question is what will happen? And I mean, some people say the food standard rate over the last 10, 20 years went incredibly up in America. So it's, it's a stunning what this country has done. And I think also, in, Houston, uh, Seattle, Portland, uh, so many, um, of course, also, also Los Angeles. I mean, there is so much is happening, but um, perhaps it's not fast enough for a lot of us, but this pandemic is, is certainly questioning um, all of it again, of what is important, what is significant, should we support global artists, if American artists don't have work, all of it. Um, what do you, from your colleagues, I know you work so, so much and um, you're so deeply engaged and you've got these decade old connections. What do you see in the world globally? What do you pick up? What do you think this is interesting or this is a model or this is something we have to be concerned about? And what is, or what is coming? Give us a little bit of an idea. Well, I, I, um, the interactions that I've had most recently have demonstrated that artists uh, who run institutions uh, in the European Union for just for this moment, they too are generating a newer relationship with their societies. And what am I saying? That it's a kind of rediscovering of what we know as community, that, you know, that we live uh, within a neighborhood and a group of people that more and more are 
they're digging into their local individual communities, plural, to find the avenues of access and to figure out how to do what they have been built their legacy on while uh, giving access to a new generation and, and to communities that never had access to the resources of institutions. And so that's happening in Paris and, and it's happening you know, in Barcelona and the same thing is true in, in Brazil. I mean, those are the communities that I've been in conversation with. And it's quite remarkable actually, because, uh, and I don't believe it has anything to do with us. I think it has to do with, these are women and men of a younger generation who realize that an error had been made in not recognizing who these individuals are and that they have been denied opportunities. And that means resources by instit cultural institutions. And so they're writing this issue uh, and that's new for all of them. Very interesting, you know, that it's, it's not, us, it's them recognizing that they have an, a responsibility and obligation to be more diverse and equitable in their work. It's, it, it, this, is, this, is, I'm, I'm, this is a powerful word. It's profound change. It's not the hierarchy of the Paris opera ballet and or opera, you know, Alexander Neath, who's the new artistic director who I worked with when he was in Toronto, um, he has a completely new agenda for recognizing the, that it's not just a citadel of elitist culture. That is, that if, if they maintain that position, um, they're no different than the Louvre, they're a museum. And he knows it will cease operating if it doesn't find new tentacles, new identities for what opera and ballet can be for Parisians. So it's just, it's a fact. I see it all the time, Frank. I think, you know, there's a real incidence of, of, you know, getting out of the ivory tower and getting in on, uh, or getting onto the streets with the people and trying to figure out how do you make art? Mm -hmm. How do you have that journey qualitatively still delivering something that's transformative or transcendent? Mm -hmm. It's a very, I, I think it's quite a remarkable time actually. What does he? What does he do? What what steps does he take to make it different than the uh, opera before? Well, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see when he's given the opportunity to lay out his first artistic season. Mm -hmm. um, what new work will be? He he's exceptionally resourceful in knowing art makers in the world of opera, and he will invest in this you know, new generation of composers who want to compose for the opera and to bring in women and men to amplify, animate these works of art. I mean that, and, um, and again, it's his work with the ballet side of his uh, art and, and his institution is cultural diversity of, of you know, women and men of color who are ballet dancers who change the equation. Mm -hmm. That's, he's a man of the 21st century. You know, he, he's recognizing this is a, a moment where he, it's not about destroying, it's about how to evolve an arts institution that's more responsive and inclusive. Um, we also had Emmanuel de Maxime Motat from the Théâtre de la Ville with us, who's also, I think, quite stunning plans in a way. Something seems to be happening. Do you think 
because the state, the cities, in a way, pay so much more for these institutions. They are feel a responsibility. Is it bitter? Is that they feel you have to react? You have to do these things. It, the funding in the U.S. often you are now next to being on the airplanes. Maybe the, the next half year was about funding. You you worked on, but and here um, it comes from private funders. So do which is you know a gr great people actually I think who support the arts. But this structural difference. Do you think this uh, is of significance? Or I, I think it's a tremendous difference between um, those countries that have governments that some give money to uh, and have done it historically. It's like not, this is like a, not a new thing that's happening. Yeah. And in it, it does give someone like Emmanuel de Marcimota uh, the opportunity to do a different kind of planning that um, we don't have, okay? But Emmanuel, um, he, he's quite a fascinating artist in, and that he has a social conscience and uh, he's also committed to education in a, a big way, not, not like, mm -hmm. it's not tangential, it, it's, it's primary with him. Uh, and he has a range of programs that the Teatro de la Ville in Paris have made possible within the educational structure that's very complicated and obviously very, very different from our education system. Let's say in a future world, um, and Emmanuel would be higher. Could he do what he does at BAM or do you think um, that would not work? Well, you know, the, uh, uh, what doesn't work is you can't take someone like Emmanuel and bring him to BAM to be the artistic director because he has no foundation, no experience in fundraising. Philanthropy is not part of his professional identity. He doesn't have to worry about it yeah, at all. Yeah, and he, he, it's not, a, there's, there's, there's no language. You know, he, he, there's no skills. He, he, he doesn't know. You know, he's a smart man. I mean, and, you know, he's an experienced theater director and, and artistic director of both Teatro de la Ville and the Festival de Tom. And, you know, he knows art, but philanthropy, fundraising of the American system is, doesn't exist. Nexis pas at all in his language. And, um, and, That it, it, it's just been a different route for American uh, artists and administrators. And, um, you know, if there's so much, uh, you, one thing I, I probably should have started this conversation with, and it's like, you know what, Frank, do you know how I self-define? I self-define as a creative professional problem solver because there's, there's not a ready answer, it's not a formula, and you gotta figure it out in, in order to create an or make a, a aesthetic judgment, uh, how to craft and create an artistic season, uh, what are the fundamentals and principles operating to create a festival and not believing or using the European model to superimpose on a performing arts institution in Brooklyn, New York, impossible. It doesn't work. You have to figure it out. And that's what kept me at BAM for so long because um, every year was tabula rasa. You know, there's, we have no resident companies. It only existed on my individual choice or the collective choice of an artistic season that allowed BAM to continue. And so that, that's the American way. And, that, and the European way is radically different, completely yeah. different. So. Yeah, as Brett said, we have to build the house uh, with the stones we have. And uh, that's what you did. And so 
fantastically. I remember that uh, Bill Clinton, when he left office, they asked the outgoing president for some recommendation. He did say the time I spent on the phone in the little room fundraising, I could not use that time to do my work, you know? Um, and he said, this shouldn't be, there should be a different way. And, and aesthetically, you know, uh, results of artistic work, of course, are related to the production structures um, of it. So it's, well, we will see if there will also be uh, perhaps um, a change in, in how, how it is produced. A personal, also a personal, a question for you. I know you also, you work with Olympia Dukakis. You worked in Montclair, the whole theater. People still talk about that theater. Uh, people have little, sometimes a little bit of tears even in their eyes and say how great um, um, that was. She once said in a discussion we had also at this evening, she said, I'm no longer, sometimes I think I'm no longer in theater for the reasons I went into it. She said something has changed. She had to look, she couldn't keep the company anymore. It was too much. She also was of course so successful. She got the Oscar. But still, she said, you know, she believes it on some like something has changed. Do you feel, how do you feel? And uh, how did you get started as the arts administrator? Oh, well, that's a, that would take another session right, to really answer uh, truthfully. Uh, but um, I, the answer in a distilled way is that. Uh, hard work, being consistent, showing up, uh, and um, relationships. If, if, if I were ever to have a tombstone, it would just read relationships because that's the fundamental takeaway of my having opportunities to do the work that I did. And so um, I have been given opportunities uh, for great women and men in the theater, in opera, in dance, and artists who I developed a relationship with and was give them a service. It's not, a, I, my job was to service the Brooklyn Academy of Music for the last 35 years of my life. And that's, and it's all about service. It's, it's not a, the cult of personality. It is about objectively, did I serve BAM well by this particular individual? and providing a home for the consistent presentation of great theater. Robert Wilson, working with a great German organization, the Berliner Ensemble. I mean, the, making it possible for uh, Peter Brook, Harvey had a, the previous relationship, and so when Harvey retired, I maintained the relationship with Peter Brook because the Harvey Theater models itself under Peter's theater in Paris called Le Bouffe de Nord. And not every work that Peter crafted, created, directed was appropriate for the Harvey Theater, but Peter knew that he had a place where he could do his work. I mean, so that all comes together in terms of uh, relationships. And, and you name the art form and I could tell you who the individuals are uh, that I was given the privilege to work with to make their artistic work happen. And, and then again, you know, that the service at the time was the, when there was not classical theater being produced here in New York City, made it possible for Sam Mendes to be engaged as the artistic director of the Bridge Project, which was never ever thought to be, you know, a standing ongoing endeavor. It was, we produced five classical plays over a three year period 
and it was half American and half uh, British actors. And the same thing with stage management, designers, et cetera. And it really was a bridge project between the UK and the USA, the city of London, the city of New York. And then we toured the world doing this work. But that was a service. And, and uh, with, uh, that's why I want to be really clear. That was the job. BAM is one of the great New York City treasures in the world of the performing arts. It has great value. It has a legacy. It's America's oldest continually operating performing arts center. You know, it started in 1861. I mean, when Brooklyn was a separate city. I mean, so that history you have to honor. And, and, um, and I know it will perpetuate. I mean, it will continue to grow and change and mutate appropriately. Mm. So, a little cultural history, Frank. No, no, no. And there is a, there is a line, also with the idea of community, whether it was done in the whole theater Montclair, the community locally in Brooklyn, and the world community you were part of in your work. And actually, now you say we are rediscovering the idea of community. Um, so. Um, there, that is something significant, you know, to hear and um, to understand and to also really implement and, and think about and redefine. And um, so, but, in the, but how did you get into uh, arts administration? How did you start out very, very early on? What, how, how did that happen? Well, you know, you, uh, in order to pay the bills, I became a stage manager. And then from being a stage manager, you, were, you studied English literature and, you and then I discovered the undergraduate, discovered theater. I started to take theater courses. Then I, I went to Catholic University of America to get my MFA in directing. And then my first job outside of, of graduate school was at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis first season uh -huh. and migrated to New York City. I started a city center of music and drama at that time. And then I went to the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia. And then I was hired to uh, work at an organization which is service organization that worked with young and emerging uh, regional theaters. It was called the Foundation for the Extension and Development of the American Professional Theater. A great man named Frederick Vogel hired me to be the theater program director to work with him. And so I travel all over the United States. It was a mentoring program using the women and the men uh, who are the progenitors of the regional theater movement to help the young and emerging artistic directors develop an administrative structure. And then um, I was asked to, I finished that and I went to Miami. Robert Herman hired me as a general manager of the new world Festival of the Arts. I did that for eight months, produced 22 world premieres in three weeks, came back to New York. Harvey Lichtenstein says, I have an idea about creating for New York City, the first contemporary performing arts festival. Would you join me to produce it? And I, the rest is history. That's in a nutshell, what, how it is. There's no mystery and I can, you know, recant all of that. For you, I mean, and, and it's, it's opportunities, you know, that that individuals saw something within me, and I think ultimately it was a work ethic. I, it, to me, it's all about the work. It's it's about doing the job. That's, that's not a mystery to me. I'm a blue collar Italian American family as my background, and and you know. My father owned a grocery store. He was his his skill or his trade was as a butcher. Yeah, you know, we worked. I worked in my father's grocery store starting at age ten. So, mm -hmm. I like work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sure. It's, it's a, the great German comedian at the time of Brecht, Karl Valentin. I believe he talked about it. He said when he was asking about art, and he was kind of a, a folk comedian. He was an odd figure, but Brecht liked him also. He said, "Art is beautiful." But it's a lot of work, and um, and we, we 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 now we realize it even more. With your experience, your vast experience, is the next mayor, maybe the Andrew Young or whoever would say, I want to have Joe Melillo on my side and tell, want him to say how we move forward in the performing arts. Let's 
put aside galleries or films or whatever, New York theater, but what would you say? What would, what would be your recommendations? Well, I think that there's, a, could, you know, in the yeah, uh, listen, uh, I think that, for me, that's a direct uh, answer because uh, I can walk from the corner of Broadway and East 9th Street all the way to the Battery, and there's one empty retail store after another. And I would say to the new mayor and the new commissioner of cultural affairs, Get artists into the, that real estate, animate that real estate so people can see artists working, enjoying, making work, no matter what it is, visual artists, performing arts, get children into the doing work inside. You want to see it. You want the arts and culture to be visible. And they're just sitting, those empty stores are just sitting there. Animate them, give them a life. That's what New York City is, is about life, animation, passion, ideas, beauty, all of those buzzwords signify New York City. Mm -hmm. Trust yes. in artists. That's what you, the mayor and the commissioner of cultural affairs needs to understand. Trust artists. They will lead you into new and wonderful, mystical, transcendent ideas and experiences. That's the answer for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's quite a, quite a radical answer also for you coming from BAM, but um, and to say, you know, and I say this is a great answer instead of saying, we need to give us five more millions to say, let's use in neighborhoods and stores, give artists work, any hamburger at the Kaufman Center, I think, um, you know, they are doing some work, others also do it, but it's not uh, yet supported in a way it could be, and perhaps it would be the very best money ever invested to, you know, have local producers, store producers. We are thinking about a little park project too, and um, so we'll have to see where this will, will go. If you, and we often ask that at, at the talk, if you had to talk to young Joe, who's just, you know, is a stage manager and then, comes to the new world stages, you know, and what would you say to him now if he would come to New York at um, the moment? What yeah. would you say? I wish I had known that at the time also, but do this or that, what, what, what would you say? Go to every artistic experience you can afford to attend because that's how you know about artists, artistic form. That's how you know what you like and don't like, what you are curious about, uh, what you don't understand, is from actually being an audience member. No matter what, and audiences for me are not only the performing arts, it's also going to a museum, going to the zoo, going to the botanic garden. It, you're feeding your own creative imagination. And, and, and in so doing, you're learning about yourself, self-knowledge. And, and if it's meant to be, you'll find a way to make a contribution through art and culture as a professional. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, good and serious advice. And I like also what you say, they go to galleries, concerts, read books, as you, you know, that it's a diverse thing, even if you're in the performing arts. And I think often it became silos, but they are, it is important. Yeah, to, uh, I agree. To yeah. Yeah, no, this is a really, really great. And, um, and it's good to, to hear you and meet you. You also know you knew Martin Siegel after whom our our center is, uh, yeah. was, and so there is a, a, a great, great uh, history and connection here, and we really um, uh, respect your work so much, what you have carried um, on your uh, shoulder, and the, the ox caram that looks also very beautiful and glamorous from the outside, and perfect, and is the closest to a Hollywood stage we have in New York for the experimental arts, but it was, it is, after all, these are run by people, like by David now, but before you, before yeah. that Harvey, it's personal efforts. It's uh, people who have a vision, people who 
who have the energy and also, um, yeah, how would I say, the, the, the vision, but also the force and to, to make that happen. It's exceptional run. Um, it's it's uh, what you did, your contribution really to the city and what it means to performing arts has been defined by your work. And, and also globally, and often New York artists and venues, they are not, not really known. People sometimes don't even know about Lincoln Center. Uh, you know, they haven't heard that in your, but everybody knows about them and people have been there and so little gets invited back. So few artists, uh, often American artists get invited, but so few can come back and them is a place which you guys made happen in Brooklyn at a time when nobody really went there, but nobody showed the work you did. It is a spectacular, it's actually miraculous um, that it happened, that it's not, you know, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Manhattan or where one would expect it, you know, and how come it's not in Queens or Dayton others? Some people got together, had an idea, there was a building, someone hired Harley from the, I think the opera, right? Uh, New York City Opera. And, and they did something, you know, where this John Cage and Mercer Cunningham, where 20 people would come and he said, I don't care, this is, yeah, they need a place. And I see a future. He anticipated the future as great, great artists. So Joe, really, um, it is um, a, a type, work of a titan you did there at that place. It's also a big history that now to, to carry on, especially then uh, in the time of Corona, I can only imagine how complicated that must be for someone like, David who takes that on and um, but you know there's a lot of goodwill and we all want to see them live succeed we all want to go there and what I miss is going to BAM being outside on the steps saying hi to people I haven't seen them whisper before the show opens let me say how is it going to be and the curtain is down and it comes up and afterwards you go out and now we realize that's life and uh, you know, and theater provides that for us. Gertrude Stein said, half of what theater, what you see on stage is not even important, but the anticipation, the meeting of the friends, the ritual to think again about life and death and love and all of that. And I think Dam is one of the venues that really did that. And we are really grateful and for such a long time that you did that. It is absolutely remarkable and, um, and perhaps also not, not fully understood, you know, how great that contribution were. And it's actually by a, by a, by a person and not the institution or the walls, it's by, by, by the leadership. So thank you, uh, we are close to the end of our talk. Maybe we should, after time, have another talk. Maybe in half a year, we'll see, you know, where things go, maybe in the fall. You know, you yes. said in the fall, we will know. So let's see um, what we'll have maybe with some colleagues. Next week, we, we, we will continue. And actually, we're gonna have uh, Jimmy on Bramer. Uh, with us. That's why I ask you also about the, you know, the next mayor, Jimmy, uh, who is a great supporter of the art. Oh, yeah. Um, in city council, and he's now running for a uh, borough, means borough president. Someone said, what does art mean to you as a person? And what do you want from the arts? You know, what will be interesting, I think, to hear. Oh, I agree. Um, like him. Um, I agree. And what, yeah, we're going to have Chris Meyer, an actor um, who, uh, is, uh, has also a political side of his work. He does workshop for anti-capitalism, but also he was in Brendan Jacob Jenkins' Of Jerome, and he was, you know, in Spike Lee films, but he feels it's the time that actors get engaged. So we're going to hear uh, from him. And then, so then we have uh, Kirill Serebrennikov from Russia, uh, a significant artist who was under house arrest uh, for years, who couldn't do his work uh, by, uh, by the government. He's one of the great uh, directors coming out of, uh, of Europe. And uh, we, are now able to connect to him and he will tell us a bit what does it mean now to to be a working artist in russia in the time of corona in the time of mm -hmm. uh, interventions very serious interventions you know uh, from the state and from the government and censorship uh, where lives are threatened and uh, what does that mean and right. um, so um really really great so Joe, thank you for, for thank wasting you, Frank. Thank you a, so another very much. afternoon with us. And it was really enlightening. It's just so great to hear from you, to see that you're well. It's good to know that you're vaccinated and we need your uh, counsel and leadership. And we'll be, see, we'll be curious to see what you, what you come up with and uh, where you will be involved. So thank you again. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting us um, and to um, our listeners for taking time out of their busy lives. So much more is out there. We started in March. I think even globally, we were the only one. Actually, for a while, we were the only 
global theater institution producing new contacts every day. We did it five days a week. It was unique. Um, that's it, Joe. Any last words um, for that comes to your mind? Something yeah, to highlight? No, no, no but my parting. Listen, Frank. Um, I think I first want to say I have great gratitude for being invited, and I want to wish you continuing success with this endeavor. And it has a very important place in American cultural history. What you and your colleagues are doing. So. Please know that I have the greatest respect for your commitment to do this. Thank you again. Thank you, Joe. That, that okay, really take care. Means a lot. I, I know you mean that, though. That's why that's really meaningful. Oh, thank you. And, and have a good, good weekend. And thank you, you too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.